I'm so glad you're here this morning. I'm really excited about today. So about a year or so ago, I met Dr. Ingrid Farrow at uh, the library. She came to participate in a scholar's weekend and was on one of the panels. And candidly, she really touched a lot of people while she was there and while she was speaking. And I asked her, would you be interested in coming back and again and, and giving a keynote address? And she said she would be honored to. And she graciously kept her word and came back. So we've had her for the weekend. She has just been a, a real uh, inspiration and comfort and source of thought-provoking dialogue and uh, innumerable things this weekend, including last night with her keynote lecture, which will be on the internet. You can watch it there if you missed it. But at the end of the lecture, as we often do, as we always do, I had uh, a chance to ask her questions that people wrote on their cards. And I couldn't get through nearly as many as there were. So I've taken the questions that I didn't get through last night and hopefully we'll get through a good bit of those today. They tend to fall into two categories. One category is just uh, everyday life, how we handle things, how we should live in recognizing the, the evil times that are around us. And the other one is much more theological. Now, Dr. Faro, uh, I will give you her biography, but I think instead I'm going to do it through question and answer, like I would a witness if I were putting a witness on the stand. The judge doesn't let you stand up and tell the jury, here are the qualifications of the witness. I've got Steve Taylor sitting right down here in the front in his new seat since he's returned uh, 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 on a little sabbatical here and and Steve has testified uh, in court before as an expert witness and the lawyers are not allowed to stand up and say uh, we're next calling Steve Taylor he's a licensed professional engineer he's got decades and decades in the oil and gas field he's da 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 you just can't do it you have to do it all through question and answer that's the format of the court so that's what we're going to do today instead of me introducing uh, Dr. Ingrid Farrow. But I would ask you to join me in welcoming her up here. Now, having started that way, will you put your hand on the Bible and raise your right hand? Do you swear to tell the... No, I'm sorry. Uh, please have a seat thank and you. thank you for being here. Thanks. So... Uh, uh, I am really delighted to get to dialogue with you, and I do have those sets of questions. But I thought at first, I want you to introduce yourself to everybody. So give them a glimpse of who you are, uh, 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 Dr. Ingrid Farrow. Thank you, and uh, it's good to be here. And since I know I'm going to be on the witness stand, I, I don't want to give away too much, I think, now. <laughs> <laughs> so, You've been well coached. Yes, yes. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, I do have a PhD in uh, Old Testament and Semitic languages, and I did that because I needed answers, and the Lord very specifically told me to go get answers from Scripture myself from the Greek and the Hebrew. And uh, so I didn't do it to be anything or anybody but simply because I had so many questions for God that I needed to get because my life was a complete disaster. <laughs> now, you got your uh, PhD uh, from a, a marvelous school in the Illinois area, yeah. Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. Yeah. Is that right? Correct. Um, it's a, a, a school dear to my heart for various reasons. It's a really top flight academic school in these areas you studied, but it's not your only degree. You have a master's and a PhD from there, I believe, but you also have another master's degree. Tell them what you got. Yeah, I also have a master's degree in the medical sciences in the area of nutrition, dietetics, public health. So, I so what'd you have for breakfast? <laughs> I had oatmeal this morning. <laughs> Which is what they tell us to eat. Did you get any of the donuts on the way in? I did not. Oh. <laughs> but I do feel, I do eat very, very healthily. I guess yeah. that's the word. Is yeah. that proper English? Uh, but 
it's just wrong to obsess about food, you know. <laughs> That's, so when people get used to get nervous around me, it's like, no, eat chocolate. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah well, that's uh, uh, some eat chocolate-covered bacon, which I think is like <laughs> boom, boom, um, the old one-two punch. Um, okay, where were you born and where did you grow up? I was born in Stockholm, Sweden. Uh, we did move to the U.S. when I was still just a baby. Swedish was my first language. Um, all of my relatives are in Sweden and Norway. And you, um, in fact, one of the cards, one of the questions last night said, great lecture. This isn't a question, but I would like to hear some Swedish. Nej, men jag kan inte tala svenska nu. Well, you know, and that's what I started to say when I read the question. But then I decided I don't have the gift of tongues, and so I didn't do that. Uh, do we have a translation? What did you tell us? I can't speak Swedish now. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you also do teach as an adjunct or in some extension capacity at a seminary in Sweden. I teach in English now. I, okay. my, um, I have, my Swedish has, has deteriorated to the point where uh, my when, my students are from multiple countries, so English is still the best language in there as well. But I read some of their papers are in Swedish and so forth. But yeah, I'm, I'm a bit too rusty after all these years of being in. All right. You grew up then. You were born in Sweden. Your parents moved to the U.S. Now, your mother did something very interesting. And I'd love you to tell everybody what your mom did. My mother uh, was in the, uh, joined the Swedish army, and it was right toward the end of World War II, and uh, she was the head dietitian, and so they went to Poland as the war was ending, so as the Russians were there and so forth, and her job was not just to feed the Swedish army, but also the people coming out of the holes in the ground, out of the bomb cities, and she stayed for four years in Poland doing refugee work. Uh, and so helping care for Holocaust survivors and people coming out of the camps. And did you, growing up, realize the significance of what your mom had done? I, I don't know if children ever do, uh, but I, uh, in the hallway closet right across from my bedroom door, there, were, there was a stack of black and white photos and postcards from, uh, from her time there. And I would frequently just look at them because they were just bombed out cities, children, starving people. And, um, and so th I did grow up with a bit of the narrative. We were not allowed to complain about anything because we would hear stories. My father also grew up, uh, he was in Norway during the war as well. And he did some espionage for the British, helped, at, uh, helped them eliminate a, uh, a Nazi submarine and so forth, lost a lot of family members. Um, and so forth. So I grew up with stories of the Holocaust. Yeah, it does make it kind of hard to complain that your toast is burned. Absolutely. There was no complaining in our household. <laughs> <laughs> um, were you an only child? No, I have an older sister. All right, so you were the baby. I was. And was it a Christian environment you grew up in? No. Tell us about that. My, uh, in Scandinavia, everybody belongs pretty much to the Swedish or the Norwegian state church, the Lutheran church. Uh, it's no longer a state church, but, uh, but that's just uh, social. So we went to a Lutheran church, but as I found out after I became a believer, I was the first one to become a Christian in my family. Neither the pastor nor the elders on the board believed in the resurrection. So I don't think you can really call it a Christian church. So it was a social place that we went out of obligation. Wow. And how did you then, growing up in that home and in that church environment, how did you become a Christian? I had had a couple of encounters with the Lord just as a child when I found out I was just three years old and I stole our neighbor's storybook of Jesus. <laughs> And uh, brought <laughs> Well, if you're going to steal a book, that's yeah, not a bad exactly. one to steal. That was the only thing I ever stole other than a nickel once I, I stole it. But, uh, and I was normally a very compliant child, but I would I put my pillow on the floor and I would sleep on the book. I knew that I needed this Jesus, even as a, a little child. So my apparently the neighbors let me keep the book. Um, but I, my parents had been through so much hardship and abuse also. It was... It was um, there were some challenges. Uh, they certainly did their absolute best. Uh, but by the time I was 16, I had come to believe that the only reason anybody is ever nice to somebody is to get something from them. 
and that would be true of the world, uh, but I did not want to live in a world like that. And my sister had told me, uh, she said, I think you're going to die of old age by the age of 25, and I simply remember thinking to myself, I sure hope so. And so um, I knew I needed something and someone, so as soon as I got my driver's license, I had heard of a Young Life group and I wanted to know who God was. And so I took the car and drove to the Young Life meeting. And there was, I don't, I know I'd heard the gospel story somewhere along the line, but the moment of impact was when this young woman, she was a Wheaton College student, came and to talk to me at the end of the meeting. I don't remember anything she said, but when she looked me in my eyes, I knew I had seen the love of God. And I had to leave and God started speaking to me on the way home, and I wept the whole way home. I wept the whole night, and I literally felt a root of bitterness, like God grabbed a giant, like a dandelion root. I could feel it coming out of my body. I felt God pulling this root of bitterness out of me, and, he, and the Lord spoke to me that Jesus had forgiven me of my bitterness and that I could have a completely different life, and I was forgiven of my bitterness that night in conversation with God. Wow, wow. <clears throat> did you go back to the Young Life meetings? Did you, how did you continue to, to grow then at this point? I did go back to some of them. I was a severe introvert. There were people who had thought I didn't know how to speak. I was that introverted. Um, and, uh, and so I really wrestled. I didn't know where to go for advice or I didn't have any idea of such a thing of discipleship, I started reading my Bible, which is where I read A Root of Bitterness. It's like, oh, that's what happened to me in the book of Hebrews. You know, God did that to me. He removed that. So, but, um, and then about a year later, I uh, happened into a Billy Graham crusade at McCormick Place. Uh, and um, so I was a Christian, but didn't really know anything. And the group of people that invited me, they were all high. Um, and <laughs> what, like literally, uh, yeah, they yeah. were on pot or okay. you know, whatever it was. Wow. Yeah. Uh, but, but I wanted to go and that was a ride. Did to they go Chicago. to steal books or did they No. <laughs> well, it turns out that the young man that, uh, was driving the car, his, his older brother was with the weatherman, not a weatherman yeah. and that had come to disrupt the Billy Graham meeting. And so I didn't know that we were sitting, we came late, we were sitting in the back and, uh, when the altar call came, all of a sudden this big group of hippies around us uh, that had seemed so cool and nice and fun and I couldn't hear a word Billy Graham was saying the whole time, all of a sudden they rose up and started storming the front and yelling, God is dead, God is a crutch. And all of a sudden these happy faces just turned spitting angry and you could just see hatred coming out of them. And I had no idea what was going on. I'm just standing there watching. And as I watched, there were three groups emerged and uh, so here was this angry group that had seemed so cool, but one of them was stand, one of the leaders standing on a chair. God is dead, God, you know, and, and you know, spits coming out. And, and, uh, and then I saw another group, which ever after I called the puckeringly pious. <laughs> <You know? laughs> <It> was, <laughs> just get them away, ooh, please. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and, uh, and then there was this other group that emerged out of the crowd that surrounded this group, prevented them from going forward. They all locked arms and they were all singing, we are one in the spirit, we are one in the Lord. And some of them were wandering around talking to these people. And I remember this one man who was standing at the foot of the chair of this leader and he had his Bible and he was saying, Jesus loves you. And his wife, you could tell she was a little scared. She had her hand on his shoulder and she's just praying and you know, she's <laughs> hanging in there. You know? <laughs> But he was just so, it was so beautiful because love was pouring out toward this hate. And so I, I waited till I could meet this man and I started going to a Bible study in his little house church. And by this man, not the one who was spitting, the, the spitting. one who was praying for it. <laughs> the praying one, yep. And I got uh, baptized, yeah, yeah. yep. And that's when you were baptized and, and well, mm -hmm. um, your life, and I don't want to spend, uh, I, I want to make sure I have time to get to some of these questions, and, and you've got some, some very good theology we want to talk through. Um, your life uh, continued, but your life, as you said last night, was not all roses. Mm -hmm. Jesus 
didn't call you and say, now that you're mine, everything's going to be easy street for you, yeah. blue skies and rainbows and sunbeams from heaven. Right. Um, you also have walked through dark valleys and sh of shadows and, and you've, you've endured a lot in your life. Uh, you referenced that last night. You've talked to me about that uh, in our previous encounter when you were here. Um, but do you mind sharing a little bit of your story? Sure. Because I think it, it allows you to speak about suffering and pain. Uh, it, it's like your credentials. You, you, mm -hmm. You've been there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I, uh, this wonderful little group that I was part of, after some years, some people entered in that uh, uh, convinced us that we needed to submit to their leadership and everything changed. It actually ended up turning into a cult. Uh, some of you may have heard of the shepherding movement going way back, and, um, and it just killed the faith of people. We went from being vibrant, seeing miracles, and just this wonderful walk with God to obey them that have the rule over you, for they have to give account for your soul, and that's the way it was told. And so uh, since I had grown up under an, in an environment where I, I very readily yielded to that, um, and being having been a very fearful kind of person, I just submitted and whatever they said, and it ended up uh, just sort of the, the short, some of the highlights of the things that went wrong from there. Um, it, it really, it distorted my view of God because they said that if God couldn't talk to me anymore, if he hadn't already talked to them. So I no longer, they, they removed my personal relationship with the Lord. And the scriptures that they taught were very specific to fit their agenda. And so they controlled our money, they controlled much of our lives, our friendships and everything. I was a bit of a rebel because I did go to, to college. I got a master's degree and, and so forth, but women were supposed to be silent in the church. Uh, we weren't supposed to speak. We weren't supposed to really get an education. We were supposed to get married, have kids, and make sure that our husbands looked good. And so, it, um, uh, so women had no role. Women were not supposed to have any role outside of the home. And so um, I did have a career, and I had a very successful career as a dietitian. I was associate professor of nutrition at one point, and, uh, but I ended up marrying someone that was kind of approved uh, because I was told the only way a woman could be in ministry was to be married to a minister, and he was in training to be a minister. He had a third of the New Testament memorized. He was leading Bible studies. He was leading little local evangelistic crusades, and this seemed like the right fit. Um, but two weeks before I got married, and it took me 10 years to admit this, I asked God, is it your will that I marry this man? And God said, no, but I know you're going to do it anyway. And so brilliant me, I said, well, then I guess it's going to turn out okay. <sighs> Boy, I, I've learned a lot since then, um, <laughs> hopefully. Uh, so, um, but he was the, even before we got married, he was abusive and unfaithful. And it just continued for any of you who are familiar with abuse. Uh, unless a person is really confronted full-on, abuse just gets worse. Uh, finally, after several years of marriage, he broke my nose one day, and I, uh, the, at the emergency room, the doctors told me, don't go home. I finally called the pastor. He said, go home and love your husband. So I went back home again, and, uh, and I didn't get out until after he tried to kill me. So his life also had been deteriorating. He had quit going to church. He was going to strip clubs and spending all our money, put us deeply in debt. I was working two jobs to start to pay off the debt that he had put us in as well. And, um, uh, but I finally, uh, after he tried to kill me, the Lord said, if I stay, I will die. And the Lord gave me a passage in Psalm 118. You shall not die, but live and declare the works, the glory of the Lord. And so it took me six months. I escaped, started going to counseling, finally was asked questions. It was a Christian counselor who was also a really good counselor, asked questions that I didn't even know I could ask, like, why did you stay? And uh, so I began just asking questions that I didn't even know I was allowed to ask. And so I uh, did end up going through a divorce. He admitted to the infidelity, but not to the abuse. But at that point, I thought, now I have a big D red D, and now I'm divorced, I can never be in ministry. So I threw myself into businesses. I'd started in the insurance business to earn money to pay off the debt that he had put us in. So for five years, I was both working in two fields, 
finally paid off his debt. And in the meanwhile, I did remarry. And um, God is so incredibly gracious. Um, the, the man that I married, he was older than I uh, was, but uh, he was a Vietnam veteran. What we had in common was uh, severe grief and PTSD. I didn't know I had PTSD. Um, and, but he saw me as a strong person and he loved me as best as he could. And we had this grand idea that maybe God actually wanted us happy. It was a new idea to both of us. So we started this grand experiment. Maybe God actually wants us happy. It was like, can we dare even believe that? So, um, but, so we, we married. Um, I had a few miscarriages, but then we had our son. And, but when our son was two, my husband became ill. It was medical malpractice. Uh, but for the next nine years, his health deteriorated. Uh, his PTSD really kicked in. He was heavily medicated, and so a lot of, lot of hardships in our home. Our son suffered traumas, not because his dad wanted to, but because of the severity of the PTSD, uh, flashbacks and things like that. So, and um, he was, the last five years, he was in excruciating pain. I was having to take care of him, do everything, uh, in and out of emergency rooms just pretty much every week and uh, surgeries, multiple surgeries. And um, after, when our son was 11, he f gave up and he took his life. And I had started an MDiv program two years before, so it was at the beginning of my second year of my MDiv program. And I remember coming to class and uh, Dr. Dennis McGarry it was a class on the prophets, and I needed to hear the very words that he spoke that day. He said the life of the prophets was not just the words that they wrote or spoke, it was the life that they lived. And, I, and God spoke that to me, that the things that I had endured and been through was going to be part of the words that God was going to speak through my life. And um, so I continued in my studies. I also had severe uh, financial setbacks. I had trusted the wrong person in my insurance. At the time that I was running two insurance businesses, consulting for a third, I had trusted the wrong person during the last couple of years of my husband's life. She was taking money out of our premium trust fund account. And um, I didn't realize it because I trusted her. And it, long story short, ended up leading to me losing everything I'd ever earned, made, saved. I was facing up to 50 lawsuits. Um, and because one of our plans had shut down, I became the insurance company for the people who couldn't get other insurance. So at that point, my son at 13 said, Mom, I think God has abandoned us. He's mad at us, and he went as far away from God. So for five years, he dropped out of high school and was just, I had to actually kick him out of the house when he was, before he was 17 because he and his friends were robbing what little I had left. I was, we were homeless for a while. And... Um, so those were some of the background. So during my MDiv program, when I thought, now I'm doing the MDiv, surely God is going to protect me and bless me now. To make sure everybody knows, an MDiv is a oh. master's in divinity. And so it's a graduate school degree that you get uh, uh, if you're looking to be in ministry. Right. Go ahead. Yeah. And so, yeah. So uh, by the time I had finished the uh, master of divinity degree, I was beat up, run over, and... I was just theologically and in every way just a mess. Um, and I did not know if God was good. For me, it was, I, for three years I had been praying and saying, God, I know you're good, but it's just a theological construct. I don't know you're good. I haven't seen it in my life. But I knew I had encountered God as a 16-year-old. And I saw how God had sustained me through the time of being homeless, through all of everything going out to pay other people's claims. And I had been learning and seeing the miracles that God was doing to protect me and provide for me. Uh, but I began, I knew I needed to do a dissertation on evil. So, and I knew the Lord had told me, and I had, I had a couple of fear of God moments that I was, <laughs> where I was, <laughs> when, when the Lord uh, told me, to get this theological degree, and I said, yeah, but they say I shouldn't. They say I, I'm, I'm wrong. I'd be wrong if I did that. I don't know if I can. I don't know if the spark plugs will still fire. You know, I was, and, and I saw myself standing before the throne of God. It was just this great white light, and I, I heard myself. I saw myself on judgment 
saying, yeah, but they said I couldn't. They, and I just heard this voice of God saying, what did I tell you to do? And boy, I tell, that was, it was that fear of God moment. When you fear God, that's why the fear of God is clean. You're not going to fear what anybody else thinks. Because I would have people in seminary, uh, both men, mostly men, and mostly students saying, you know, you're not supposed to be here. What are you getting this kind of a degree for? Who do you think you are? You know, you're a woman. You're not supposed to do this stuff. So I was still getting that. But it was like, take it up with God. <laughs> I'm not going back there again, you know. <laughs> so. Well, you, you, you took the, the languages. You took Hebrew. You took mm -hmm. Greek. Yeah. Um, I, I, that, those aren't easy languages. No, nope, a little Ugaritic, West Semitic inscriptions. And, yeah, yeah, some of the yeah, other yeah. Acadian, yeah. Um, uh, I mean, that, that, that's what I, I went through academically as well. Yeah. And I... I, I don't know how, so how old were you when you were learning those languages? I started at 45. Well, God bless you. That's <laughs> almost impossible. Um, wow. Okay, so you wind up, you get these degrees. You've got your, dis, did you do a dissertation? Yeah, my dissertation was on evil in Genesis from the Hebrew text of Genesis. Evil on, in Genesis from the Hebrew text of Genesis. Now, um, uh, uh, evil, as we do this dialogue, is there, we are up here, yes. Let's see if this is right. So evil is the Hebrew ra. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's spelled R, it's usually vocalized with an A sound for the I-N. Yeah. But you're gonna hear us talk about ra, and that is uh, evil, but it's not just evil, it's also a word that, that can mean uh, calamity, um, I was reading this morning in Micah, uh, and in Micah, the first chapter, you know, God brings calamity uh, uh, upon the people, and, and Ra is the word that's used there. Um, but it, it also is our idea of evil, and we'll be discussing that. We'll also be discussing another Hebrew word, which is Tov, and Tov is, is the idea of good. Um, you'll hear boka tov and, and other expressions of good um, from the Hebrew. And uh, I, I want everybody to have those words in your brain as we talk through this. So you do a dissertation. Ultimately, you've got books out on this stuff and chapters in books. I would love to hear your definition of Ra when it's used to denote the idea of evil. Mm -hmm. So tell us what you mean by that, or what you believe that the, the text means by that. Uh, the definition that I use to make things simple, to land on a short definition, uh, because the word evil has a very wide range of use in the Hebrew Bible. Mm. And so we can't overly simplify it, which is what we want to do. But my easy definition is uh, is evil is the, um, the corruption of creational and relational good. The corruption of creational, creational and relational, and you could say covenant, but relational goodness or good. And so some people speak of evil as an absence of good. Mm -hmm. You're removing it from that definition and giving it a different one. Is that fair? Very definitely, I am. Uh, I spend a lot of time trying cases that deal with cancer. Mm -hmm. And I remember being um, learning that you can have a, a good cell mm -hmm. And for some reason, uh, there, we'll put a nucleus in it. For some reason, that good cell, the DNA, can alter. Mm -hmm. And that good cell can become a, a cancerous cell. A good cell will die when it's supposed to and, and divide when it's supposed to. But a cancerous cell uh, often uh, doesn't know how to die. It just yeah. keeps growing. And, it, and it, it takes something that's good and makes it a disease. Mm -hmm. uh, it takes something that's good and corrupts it into evil. Mm -hmm. 
exactly. That's your concept of, of Ra mm -hmm. when it's used in this sense of evil. Mm -hmm. Is that fair? Yes. Okay. And then, of course, the great physician enters in to take the illness and to bring healing mm -hmm. and to restore what is good. Mm -hmm. So if that's evil, what is good? How do you define good? Good is that which produces life and blessing. And that's from the creational part of it. And we can also move that into the relational part as well. So that which produces shalom or wholeness, well-being. So it produces life, blessing, shalom, peace, fullness, all that's in, in, enveloped in that word as well. Mm -hmm. um, now, that gets us to some of these theological questions. And so let's spend about 15 minutes and go through some of these together. Someone asked last night, if God created everything that exists, then he must have created good and evil. What do you say in response to people who ask that question? I, my response is that God created everything good, but he also created consequences for, uh, for misusing the good. So just like with the cancer cell and, and you know, uh, we talk of fractals, everything from the tiny to the cosmos is, is related. You know, there's, there's oneness to everything. So you can look at the smallest thing to get a picture of the biggest and vice versa. And so we can look at even physical things like this to gain an understanding of the spiritual because God knows we're physical people. We're, we are embodied spiritual beings. And so God gives us physical things to help us understand the spiritual things. And the, the example of cancer is a perfect example. Or I used the example last night of rat poison, which is 98% good food, but you just put a little bit of poison in. And so evil derives its power from the good. Good is, has life in itself, like the seed is life. Good has life in itself. But when you take that power of the good and instead of using it for God's purposes, all of a sudden uh, you use it for your purposes, you divert the direction because everything that God does is good. So when we are in alignment with what God is doing, the power of the good can go forward. And the more we're in alignment with God and his word and his ways and, and his spirit, the more that power of the good can go forward, which is why Jesus, of course, Jesus was God, but he was also fully human. And so there was absolutely nothing hindering the goodness of God to just gush through him. Everywhere he went, he brought life. He, he couldn't go to a funeral without bringing people to life. Everywhere he went, he brought life to their soul, to their heart, to their spirit, to the word, that, because that is who God is. But when we come in and we, we don't, we try to divert that direction that God is going and say, nope, I want it my way. It's like throwing a stone in the river. And now all of a sudden, and then you keep throwing stone and you divert and all of a sudden that river is now creating other gullies. It's making other pathways. And so we as humans, when we're, we are in alignment with God's vision and God's purposes, we become a power for good. But when we say, nope, I don't want God's way, I want my way. And now we divert that power of good and now it takes off and it starts creating paths toward evil. So evil only gets its power from the power of the good being diverted to now create destruction. So if, if we think about it, uh, almost all of our sins and vices are exactly that, a diversion of good. Mm -hmm. um, I can um, eat wonderful things that are good for my body and, and moderation, even things that, that uh, may be good for my taste buds more so than my uh, waistline uh, uh, in moderation. But if I become a binging eater, uh, mm -hmm. I, I, there's a can of tuna that is like a staple in my diet. And I eat this can of tuna for breakfast, lunch, and dinner if my wife is not there to say, stop it, or you're going to turn into mercury itself. <laughs> you can't eat that much tuna. But I would just eat, eat tuna for every meal, and I'd be fine. And, and yet, I wouldn't be. I'd be doing something in an extreme. Uh, I would be diverting something that's good and, and giving it 
you know, God, Paul talks about people whose God is their appetite because mm -hmm. they've started uh, uh, worshiping what, what they eat and what they, they sense and, and sensuality. You take uh, uh, sexuality in the right place that God placed it, it's a blessing and it's a, it's a joy and it's something that's good. You divert it into the wrong arena and it's, it's, it's destructive and it's unholy and, it's, and it brings bad. Mm -hmm. You take uh, uh, words and the ability to talk mm -hmm. and if you do them in positive, uplifting uh, ways, you can be a power for good, but you can take the same words and use them for gossip and backbiting and slander and you can create forest fires with your words that, that do horrible things. This idea of evil being a corruption of what is good, I think is very, not just sound in Genesis, but I think it's found in our lives. Would you agree? Absolutely. You said it well. Um, okay. So here's the next question. Mm -hmm. If we are made good, then why are we born with a sinful nature? Are we born evil and we need God to make us good? Yeah, that's, that's actually, that's a, a tough one for me even to answer because I I tend to take a little bit more of the Jewish approach, you know, as far as the, the Bible doesn't use the word original sin and even the word nature, you know, it's, it's, it, it, uh, it talks about a soulishness, tsukikas. So, um, so the soulishness is just us. So we're supposed to be pneumatikas, so spiritual beings, and, and our soul is the rest of our identity. So if our identity becomes one with the Lord, the spiritual, then we become good. So nature, so we do have the propensity because all around us from the moment we're born and even when we're in the womb, we're hearing arguing, we're hearing, you know, there's evil. So we are, we are born into a world at war is more the way I see it. We are born, even before we're born, uh, we are soaking in the world. So even before we're born, we really don't even have a chance uh, because we, we hear the sounds of, of honking and noise and arguing and, and trouble all around us. So I see it as more just the world. We are born into a world that even before we have a chance is telling us lies about who we are. Um, uh, the, the approach that, that I might use, and, and it maybe contrast some, but also illustrate some of what you're saying, uh, uh, is, is one of, uh, I think in, in a biblical sense, uh, the, they didn't understand in New Testament times DNA, for example. Uh, I don't know if John Walton's in here this morning. Yes, there you are. We were looking at a, a Bible that's been ornately done and it had the family tree of Jesus, and into that family tree was drawn strands of DNA. Mm. And I think John's the one who said, you know, I don't think they understood DNA back then. And, <laughs> and I think Francis Crick would agree with you, and, uh, 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 or Francis Collins. It was Crick and uh, Watson who did the, got the Nobel for the DNA, I think, uh, unraveling part of it. Anyway, aside from poor history that's not working in my brain, um, in the time of Jesus, for example, and, and before, but let's just take Paul's writing to the Romans. Uh, they didn't understand necessarily DNA, but they certainly understood that from a man's seed and from a woman's body come life. And so there was a mentality that within a father, and to some degree the mothers, but, but within a father, are the offspring because they're present within uh, his loins in, in a sense, and uh, to use a biblical term. And so when the father does something uh, and, and something happens to the father, it can have an effect on the children. Now, mm -hmm. sin visits to a generation or whatever, but, but even beyond that is this mentality that Paul seems to express that in Adam, we're all there. You know, we, we hadn't come to be yet, but genetically, in our parlance, we were there. And his point being that when Adam sinned, in a sense, it spread to everybody because we're all born into that world at war. We're yes. all born into that condition. And, and while the Bible doesn't use those 
terms the way we do. Uh, uh, you get the NIV, I think, uses sin nature, mm -hmm. but that's not really what Paul's term is, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, as you pointed out. Um, but, but all of us were made for something much purer. Mm -hmm. All of us were made to be good. And the, you, you don't have to teach kids to disobey. They, they get that automatically. I've never had trouble with any of my kids knowing how to disobey. They know how to do that <laughs> automatically. Right. They know how to cry. They know how to whine. They know how to uh, manipulate. They know they got it all by like age two weeks. Exactly. And, uh, exactly. <laughs> right. But we need to teach them to, to, we need to cultivate that which is good, which is their higher calling. Yeah. which God does. So yeah. I don't know. I, I like the way you say it. We are in a world at war. Mm -hmm. That's clear. Yeah. Um, what do you say then to those who say that everything that happens is God's will? Yeah, I, uh, I actually used to believe that. Uh, and I don't anymore um, because it's become so clear to me as I continue to study scripture. And again, by the end of my Master of Divinity, I actually did believe that everything that happened was God's will. Um, and so I, made, so I understand how you get to that theologically. I just no longer agree. I think that that's missed a whole lot of the rest of the passages of scripture uh, where we see plan, God's plan B and so forth, other things taking into effect, and where we see the importance of choice. So right in the beginning, the choices that we make, God gives us the ability to make choices. He's not a puppet master. And, uh, and even him making us in his image according to, to his likeness is, means that we have that, we have their freedoms that we are given uh, to our own detriment, but we have the freedom to choose God or to choose other. And it is those choosing other that causes the diversion of the good. Yeah, amen. So, um, uh, yeah, I, I, I do these video thoughts for the day yeah. on five days a week. They go on the internet and periodically YouTube, I'll look at comments. And I had a fella, uh, seems like a good fella, but take me to task because of one of them, where he said, don't you understand that, that God determines everything in, in essence, is the way I took his comment at least. Mm. And, and everything is God's will. Mm. And you don't, you know, you didn't, you don't have any choice in this matter. And I said, you know, that's not the fullness of scripture. Mm -hmm. uh, you, one of the passages I, I tried to get him to explain to me um, was how can Jesus lament over Jerusalem and say, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how I would have gathered you right. under my wing as a hen does her brood, but you would not. I said, mm -hmm. doesn't that make God, Jesus, somewhat hypocritical if he Shouldn't he be saying, but I decided not to, so mm -hmm. there. Yeah. I mean, but no, Jesus says, you would not. Mm -hmm. I would have, but yes. you would not. Yeah, yeah. And even in his hometown, when he went there and they're saying, but aren't you the carpenter's son? And, and so forth. And, and uh, it says he, he couldn't do many miracles there because of their unbelief. Yeah. So even there's an example of, it's like, we're not going to believe you. So he goes, okay. You know, I, I love in C.S. Lewis's book, The Great Divorce, uh, where there's the, uh, where he said, my paraphrase, either God, either we turn to God and say, your will be done, or God turns to us and says, okay, your will be done. So it's, yeah. and I, I really so appreciate that very succinct expression. Yeah, he, he, he did that yeah. so well. I, it, yeah. I also, there's a book by Udo Middleman, mm. and uh, Udo Middleman, uh, yeah. lawyer, uh, uh, so I don't think he's practiced law in at least 50 years. Um, Udo Middleman basically says, quit blaming God for everything bad that happens. Yeah. You know, God's trying to stop it. Mm -hmm. And he's in charged us with responsibility to go out there and stop it. Mm -hmm. so, so don't blame him. Yeah. Uh, get, get your act together and go out there and work with him to stop the evil. Exactly, exactly. Okay, so in that regard, let me ask you about some, let's transition to some of these, what can we do about it? Question, what do you think is the most important thing we can do when ministering to someone who's in the middle of suffering? First is show up. 
just be there in whatever capacity they want you or will allow you. Um, whether it's on the phone, I've sat silently on the phone for extended periods of time with someone who is at the other side of the country or, or the world and they just, we just sat silently or going to their home. Um, don't speak, don't offer advice. When someone's in the midst of suffering is not the time to make theological conclusions. And if they try to, discourage or say this is not the time. This is the time to just feel what you're feeling and, exp and just walk, go through that process. And so the, the first is simply being present with them. Um, and, um, and then just stick with them as they process because all grief, all trauma, all suffering, all loss takes time to process. Forgiveness is something that takes time to process. We make that trite too. It's a, it's, there's nothing trite about any of that. And so, and you know, so when people say, oh, just forgive them, or you know, so often we feel so uncomfortable with other people's pain that we want it to go away. So we try to bring them a solution so we will feel better, but it's not helping them at all. So we need to join in their process and, uh, and be there prayerfully. And, and uh, you know, you, you've lived a life where you've suffered at the hands of various people. Mm -hmm. um, you've certainly had to confront forgiveness uh, for your first husband, for your business associate, uh, for others. Yeah. I mean, is that an overnight thing? How, do you, how, mm -hmm. do, how, how does someone walk through that as a Christian? What advice would you give to someone it, it, would you give advice to someone who's trying to learn how to forgive or to work through that? Um, I, I, at some point, I might if I was asked, but it's important for us. Forgiveness did not come easy for God. God didn't just say, oh, okay, I forgive you all. He paid the ultimate price for our forgiveness, and it was a process. And so why should we think forgiveness would be easy for us? Uh, forgiveness costs. Uh, there's a book by Edith Egger. She's a clinical psychologist who went through the Holocaust. She's not a Christian, but she is Jewish. And she has a chapter in her book called Forgiveness Requires Rage. And that's when I said, I need to read this book. <laughs> uh, because God is angry at the thing, at, the, at our sin, because he knows that that is what has brought evil into our lives as well as others. And so I, I see even God's wrath as an expression of his love because he knows that the wrongs that we are doing are bringing devastating harm to ourselves and other human beings and we're supposed to be angry with it. But the anger is supposed to just say, I, I remember for example when um, I told my parents and my sister, uh, I was still married, my husband was in the other room and this was not long after he had broken my nose and I still had the scar. And my mother and father kind of said, well, you know, that's... My sister, who had also been abused, jumped up, ran in the other room, and started beating on him, saying, don't you hurt my sister. And I needed to see that. I needed to see her rage, because that's what I needed to feel. I needed to say, this was wrong, this was evil. I was trying to say, well, it's okay, I just need to forget. No, it was evil and it was wrong, and he should have been confronted. So the process of forgiveness does require calling out what was evil. And if the other person does not want to engage in that process, forgiveness to me, then there's a point where it's, it's releasing it to God and saying, okay, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. Lord, you take care of this because you're going to handle it a lot better than I will. And so I give it to the Lord. And you still, I can still pray for the person, but I've got to call what is evil, evil. We have to name what is evil just as we have to name what is good. Yeah, there's the, the, the prophets uh, do say, and I can't remember if it was someone in here is going to know this. Uh, Isaiah or was it Hosea? But it was somebody whose name ended in Yahweh. Uh, who, the prophet who, who indicts those uh, for saying, you know, yeah, to good it's evil, mm -hmm. or to evil it's good, and to, yeah. to good it's evil. Yeah, yeah that's not exactly. a good thing. Yeah. Okay, um, where do you suggest people start to overcome childhood trauma mm. so they don't repeat it in mm. their own family? Well, the first thing is to start to over, you know, just recognize 
Um, I think everybody should probably go to a counselor. Uh, and I don't even know if I need the word probably in there because it's just like a wellness check. How am I doing? You know, you have to find a good one, but it's just so helpful to sit down and talk with someone. Uh, and, and certainly, do, no matter what it is, whether it's a good friend, a, a counselor, somebody that has a solid walk with God whose life you would want to emulate and just begin conversations with them because the worst thing is to keep it all in your head. I see it, it's, it's kind of becomes like a dust storm in your head. When you talk to someone, it's like opening the doors and the windows and letting that dust out. It's, it's, you start to be able. Uh, the Lord was real clear with me. I was a complete loner. I was carrying everything inside and God very specifically told me, if you don't get back in church, if you don't start fellowshipping with other people, you will not be healed. And so we need to, open up, we need to be able to talk, which is why one of the reasons that I have these conversations. We have to talk about evil, we have to talk about trauma, because if we keep it in our own heads, we cannot be healed. So we have to find, and then just say, Lord, show me what I need to know. And then just say, Lord, just lead me. So every time now, if I come across a situation, a heartbreak, a pain, something that's like, Lord, who should I talk to? Show me in your word where I need to go and just help me process this. One of the things I love about our church, and I hope all of you know this, but uh, uh, it, it is, you know, we, we, we are in such a large church, and it, a lot of times you, 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 it's helpful to know the resources that mm. the funding in a large church enables us to do, that we have an amazing counseling program here with licensed professional counselors who are Christians who do not charge you Mm -hmm. to see you and to help you work through issues. And they do it with confidentiality. They do it uh, with God's love. And they are good, strong Christian people. And uh, uh, it's, it is something that, that people need to know is a resource here, not only if you might need the resource, but also because you're a part of this church. So you're providing that for others mm -hmm. as you... Uh, 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 integrate into this church and become a part of it and and it's a a marvelous thing that's fantastic um now you referenced last night uh manipulation mm. uh and, and i'm not sure what this question's referring to but uh if you understand it great and if not if maybe it's, it will spark you to talk about this briefly and we've got about four more minutes mm. um how can you determine the difference between manipulation and protecting yourself mm. And I'm not sure those are distinct. But, but, but explain how you maybe protect yourself from manipulation mm -hmm. or, yeah. or... Yes, because uh, being aware of manipulation is certainly very important. Um, and also being aware when you are the one manipulating. The Lord had to correct me with my son when he was, had just completely left God. And he said, I can share it's his story now because it's, you know... We're, we're very close, and, and he's come a long way. Uh, but, um, but the Lord showed me that, that I was manipulating him because, trying to, because it's like obviously he wasn't doing things that were healthy for his life or his, his present or his future or for me. And so I would do things like, oh, you're breaking your mother's heart and you know, that, that kind of things that I had been taught. You know? and, uh, and the Lord one day just said, did I ever manipulate you when you were walking away from me? said, I was there for you when you wanted to hear from me. You know, I was there. And, uh, and so I had to go to my 17-year-old my son and ask his forgiveness for manipulating him and ask him to call me out any time that I did. I remember the first time he did. We, Mom, I didn't realize how passive-aggressive you could be. It was like, all right, deep <laughs> breath, receive this. <laughs> I'm not passive aggressive. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> okay, fine. I, yeah. No. <laughs> yeah. But, it's, it, but it is important just to be aware of when we're feeling the pressure from others or if we're giving pressure to others and, and how do we help others to grow without pressuring them. And, you know, that's why, why also we're so uncomfortable when people are going through pain and suffering. People left me in droves when I had all these things happen to me. They, you know, they would no longer get together with me. It wouldn't answer my calls because, and I knew they were just so uncomfortable with the pain I was going through. And that can be a form of manipulation too. So letting go of our expectations and it ultimately comes down to saying, God, I'm going to trust that you are at work. So, with, so God said, I am your son's father. I am here for him. 
and I need you to trust that I am at work, whether you see, doesn't matter what you see, what you can make sense of, doesn't matter what you hear, I am at work in his life. Trust me. Which brings me to my final question. Yeah. Does God win? Does good win out? Absolutely. I have, I have come to so know the love of God and that God is just and God is so merciful and so gracious. And even in the times of silence when it feels like he's not there, God does allow these evils into our lives. And I, I, there's so much more I would love to say, but he doesn't do them. And he's with us in our suffering. He is there with us. And uh, I, one of my favorite passages that the Lord spoke to me, a simple one that everyone will remember because most people have memorized Psalm 23. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because you are with me. And the Lord spoke to me, don't lay down in the valley of the shadow of death. Don't set up your camp there because, and fear nothing bad, no matter how bad things are, no matter what the diagnosis, no matter what you hear about your child, no matter what happens, fear nothing because I am with you and I want to bring you through. And, and I've realized even if I do become a casualty of war, you know, if, if I'm martyred, whatever happens, I know where I'm going. I know my Redeemer lives. I have glimpsed, I've seen the other side. I know where I'm going. And I know it's the place where there will be no more sorrow. Um, amen. amen. And I'll just kick in one last word on that. A lot of people look at Psalm 23 and think, well, I'm not dying, though you may feel like it. Um, an equally valid way to translate that is, even though I walk through the dark valley. Yes. It doesn't have to be the valley of death itself. Right. We think of that with funerals. A mm -hmm. dark valley. Exactly. Uh, even though I'm walking through the darkest valley there is. Right. Just don't camp there mm -hmm. and don't fear the evil because God is with you. So would you join me in thanking Dr. Farah? Her, her transparency, I hope, will bless you. I know it has me. Can I bless you in the name of Jesus, and then we'll, we'll head to church. Um, Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask your blessing upon all who hear these words, that you will minister to them not only comfort in the midst of grief, but illumination in the midst of darkness. That you will be that beacon that shines, that grabs our attention and draws us to it. And that we will follow you through this life, seeking to bring your good in every dark corner we encounter. Not just in our own hearts and minds, but in this world around us. We live to serve you, our one God. In Jesus' name, amen.